very much, Mr. Papadato. And I must say that uh, when, I, when I hear about the commitment of a political representatives uh, at all level, you know, we heard from the mayor yesterday, from the president of the region uh, as well, and now we hear from you, from the metropole too, uh, we feel that we, we really found uh, the right place to hold this European Organic uh, Congress. So thank you again for your uh, welcome and for your support to the development of organic farming as well. Uh, good morning, everybody. Now we're going to have a session about uh, carbon farming. And as you know, the organic movement is quite keen to be part of a solution to prevent dangerous uh, climate change. And now, at last, there are political discussions on uh, how agriculture can reduce its emissions, food production can reduce its emissions, and how the agriculture sector can also be part of a solution by storing more carbon uh, in soils. And you probably know that the European Commission is currently working on a policy initiative on carbon farming, which is precisely aimed at incentivizing uh, more carbon sequestration uh, in soils by farmers uh, or foresters. And I must say that um, such policy initiatives represent a kind of dilemma for the organic movement, because on the one end, of course, organic farming is in the first place about healthy soils, and it is scientifically proven that there is much more sequestration of carbon in soils, uh, crops, cropland soils and, and pastures with organic farming uh, practices. On the other end, when we see that discussion sometimes uh, really put a narrow focus on carbon alone, uh, we, we feel that it's a, a, a kind of reductionist approach that disregards many of, uh, of the other externalities of uh, uh, agriculture and on biodiversity in the first place. It's a bit the, the debate that we had yesterday on sustainability labeling uh, as well. If you solely measure greenhouse gas emissions and carbon, uh, according to liters of milk produced, you will uh, mathematically conclude that, you know, only yield matters and that you need to further intensify uh, the system uh, as well. And last but not least, uh, many of these discussions focus on uh, using carbon markets approaches, which the organic movement is also uh, discussing. And uh, on the one end, many farmers, both conventional and organic, very much hope that, you know, trading carbon could be a way to, to, to channel uh, more money to the farming community. On the other end, many others, also based on, in, on experiences in the US, for example, do not expect that farmers will benefit from such approaches. But we are not here today to discuss these uh, complex policy issues. Uh, the goal of this session is very much to hear from inspiring initiatives from the organic movement in, uh, in a few countries on how organic farming uh, can be better part of a solution even more uh, than it is today. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, our panelists for this session. First of all, we will hear from uh, uh, Sibyl Kurt from Organic Denmark. Uh, Sibyl, you can uh, please take uh, uh, a seat here. Uh, Sibyl is since 2012 Head of Farm and Food Policy at Organic Denmark, developing policies for organic farming. She represents Danish organic farmers and processors and is in charge of uh, advocacy work uh, with the Danish government. And you also lead the development of a concept of ecology lift for moving the organic production beyond the rules established within the European organic regulation. And you also develop a proposal for a new model for common agricultural policy that integrates carbon tax in the support model. It's called pricing sustainability, and this is what you will uh, uh, present to us uh, in a minute. Uh, with us, we will have also uh, Charles Pernin. Charles, please take a seat. Uh, Charles Pernin is the executive director of Synabio the Union of Organic Processing and Distribution Companies uh, in France. And last but not least, we will also have uh, Cédric Guillot uh, with us. Uh, Cédric is the owner of Cave Guillot, where he makes organic wine. Uh, he took over the wine estate in 2014, passing on the estate to the fourth generation in the family. And he is also the vice president of BioSuisse since 2020 and a member of the IFOAM Organic Syrup Farmers Group. So please, a quick round of applause for our panelists. 
And without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to, to Cedric, uh, who will present us. Please, you can present from here. And uh, you can normally control your presentation if everything goes well. And you will present us the ambitious uh, uh, BioSwiss uh, plan uh, to go carbon neutral. Thank you, Cedric. Merci, Eric. Um, Already, um, let me start by saying what an honor it is for Bio Suisse to be uh, invited to talk to you today to present um, what we're doing, uh, what the neighbors are doing. As a winemaker, an organic winemaker in Switzerland, obviously, I was, um, it's, a, it's an emotional experience to, uh, to be here in uh, Europe's holy capital of wine, in the, uh, the city de Van, no less, so it really is an honor, and I'm happy to be here. Bertrand Picard is a Swiss scientist, uh, a number of um, sol world records, solar impulse, for example. He said, ideal is great. Being idealistic is even better. That's a bit what we try to do uh, at Bio Suisse, including climate condi conditions in our technical specifications at all levels, so that every farmer, winemaker has to respect these goals in the long term. Bio Suisse, to be very quick with you. We have 7,200 farms. I think we're close to 7,300 now, actually. A lot of organic, mostly up in the Alps, and uh, slightly less down in the plains. Uh, and now, uh, uh, a few words on the context in Switzerland. There's a political target which has been set, which is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% from the 1999 level. And we're at least 50% self-sufficient. And we want to be 50% of that carbon reduction coming in from Switzerland and 50% from offset elsewhere. A new strategy and goals at the federal level are currently being developed by the, uh, the Federal Office for Environment and Federal Office for Agriculture. They're working on the next strategy now. forgetting to move my slides. But if we look at agriculture as a whole, organic and conventional, we can observe the, um, the uh, this is combining energy, manure storage, uh, li livestock, land management, even the carbon uh, balance of land use. So since uh, 1990, we have seen a reduction which is largely due to reduction in the number of livestock. That red line is at the top is the the target, the political target set by Swiss politicians. Sorry, no, no, the opposite. That's the, the lower arrow, the, the arrow going downwards, that's the target that was set by politicians. And the higher line is where we're actually at. So you can see that there's more effort to be made. So we as organic farmers in Switzerland, as Bio Suisse, where do we want to go? Well, we've set ourselves an objective in our technical specifications. We started by saying what we need is more protection, more resilience. Internally, we started thinking and discussing and exchanging opinions with our member associations. We then consulted uh, the FIBUL. The agency has launched a, a scientific study to, 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 to asking whether net zero is, e is even possible for agriculture in Switzerland. We then conducted an agricultural uh, and environmental analysis with um, licensing agencies, Coop, Migros, and others, big uh, retailers in Switzerland. We consulted them because um, they're also members of Bio Suisse, their business partners. And they accepted to to get involved, which is um, a, a big step forward, actually. That uh, that important part of the value chain, the distribution side, uh, played along and decided to, to get involved and working towards net zero. We also asked the Federal Bureau for Agriculture to provide us some some expert advice. Obviously, there are there are political decisions and financial decisions to be made. 
And we also decided to work with external experts from other associations and NGOs, including WWF, Bioland, and others. To achieve this, we started in August 22 with 80 people, primarily farmers, 80 participants, most of them organic farmers in Switzerland. We also had scientists and representatives of NGOs. We had a, a discussion day with the, the goal that for the, uh, the Delegates Assembly in 2022, 20, which is delegates from BioSwiss would, would be able to take a, a decision on whether or not to integrate this goal into our technical specifications. So we discussed uh, different subjects of, of critical importance in climate and agriculture. The objectives we came out with were where are the boundaries of the system and how can we facilitate the implementation of our climate goals? What about animal welfare and climate? How do we measure are the progress made in improving environmental criteria? What do our members need? What is the role of the retailers in, in offsetting? And what positioning should Beer Swiss adopt for the future? We came up with some concrete measures too, including agroforestry, solar panels, and biogas. What was, the th what was the thinking behind that? What were the arguments that came up? We wanted to send a strong signal to politicians for, for to be, be proactive, laying the cornerstones for future developments. And we wanted to highlight the responsibility of all stakeholders in the value chain. That for effective climate protection, we need action at every stage of the, of the value chain, from producers right down to consumers. Creating structures by that, we mean each farm is unique. Well, we need to create structures capable of helping businesses to take an active role, as play an act, as active a role as they can. Communication, because organic is about more than just climate. Conflicting perspectives need to be taken into account, weighed up, and decisions need to be taken. That includes issues such as animal welfare. This uh, graph is provided by FIBEL. They estimate that by 2040 in Switzerland, uh, I hope this is a, a low bracket, pessimistic estimate, they think that 25% of Swiss uh, farmland will be organic by the BSW standards, by Demeter or federal organic standards. And in that case, we would have 1.5 million tons of carbon. Zero, net zero is a very, uh, uh, very ambitious objective, but it is nonetheless possible. Feeble estimates that the potential for reducing carbon fixing in the soil and the offsetting of carbon reduction with the energy, re renewable energies, could account for 60 percent. Those are the three bottom boxes you see there. So reducing by optimizing uh, agricultural management managing uh, fertilizer, including, managing animal feed, extending uh, animal li lifespan, etc. Uh, carbon capture through agroforestry and the generalized use of vegetable car of plant carbon and soil humification. Emissions from agriculture are also highly dependent on the, the value chain, the structure of the value chain, right down to consumption. Reducing food waste and including more plant-based diets are essential criteria. As a calculation for it, the FIBO took the, uh, the objectives included in the climate strategy set out by the Swiss uh, Federal Office for Agriculture, which is a goal for food consumption to respect the, the edicts of the food pyramid. In spring of 2022, so very recently, we had our General Assembly and a decision was reached. And the delegates voted in favor of promoting climate resilience. What does that mean exactly? As an association, we decided to define the, the, the path that we will take towards achieving and this is was very precise, in fact, the objective we set ourselves because we wanted to, we wanted to make sure we got the, the yes vote. 
we are heading towards net zero. That's important. We're not saying net. We have. We're clear. We're not saying net zero in the near future, but we're saying we're moving towards net zero. That was the, the phrasing. We want to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions towards net zero by 2040 and to promote greater climate resilience. So how are we going to achieve that? What are the measures that we're going to take? The principle adopted, adopted by the, that vote sets out the major steps to be taken between now and 2040. The, the first program up until 2025, which is currently in development, will focus on four key pillars. That's knowledge acquisition and sharing effective measurement of progress, promoting a favorable framework that includes pol political framework and a market conditions, and fourthly, communication networking. We're also going to create what we call probio groups. These are groups of um, farmers from in a similar sectors who can decide amongst themselves how best to apply the measures to work towards that target of, of net zero. We're going to provide them with a toolbox, providing them resources on how to how to achieve. Because, as we, as I said, all farms are individual and have their own individual requirements. We've um, can we've commissioned a bio inspector for our EcoCert partner to identify a pertinent tool. A bio inspector, what's good about them is that they're, they're used to working with this every year. They go out and uh, they visit and check uh, bio Swiss farms. So they're, they're already present on the ground in the field. It's not going to be easy for them. They've got all the data available. They know the, the, the hectares, they know the, the types of farming involved. We just need a bit more data from, uh, from wine growers and from, and from farmers to, to achieve the, the, all the data we need to, to create this, uh, this workable toolbox and to provide for each different types of farm to, to identify the needs, the requirements of the coming years, and what measurements we need to, to have a, a, a basis from which to work on. And the objective is to, um, between now and 2025, to go out and inspect 120 more organic farms, gather that data, and to, to feed the tool. That climate carbon, or carbon audit needs to identify uh, potential areas for improvement for each farm to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions and um, to provide a breakdown then of the greenhouse gas emissions across the whole organic sector. And in terms of communication, here's um, it's an example of what we can do. It's about setting out a clear framework for that communication. And this is what we call um, bioland, bio land, organic land. Is Swiss, the Swiss dream is they have a green functioning ag agriculture. You might not like the, um, the fuel tank there in the middle. Perhaps uh, what I'd like to see in the future is that from 2035, we'll have no more diesel petrol cars on the roads in Europe. So why not tractors? Anyway, I'll conclude on that note. Thank you. Cédric, and congratulations to the Swiss Organic Movement for giving yourself these very ambitious objectives. Uh, I have some questions for you, but uh, I, I think we'll, uh, I want to hear from Denmark now and from Sibyl, please, because the Organic Denmark also has some interesting vision on how to, to reduce emissions from the agricultural sector. So please, the floor is yours, Sibyl. And thank you for being here. And I really support the idea that we should have, a, the Bordeaux should be the capital of bio, but I believe the, the Union, the European Union should be the Union of bio. Um, just a small comment on, on the uh, good uh, vision or ambition that bio Swiss they have taken in, Den in organic Denmark, oh, not in organic Denmark, in Denmark, we have adopted a climate law that obliged Denmark to reduce uh, CO2 emission by 30 by 70 percent when we reach year 2030, and the uh, farm sector should reduce their emissions uh, in between 55 and 65 uh, percent. So this covers the organic sector as well. But yes, I will 
uh, present you to a model that we are very uh, that we hope could be implemented in order to to reach the goal. At first, I want to say, oh, it is it worked. It changed. That organic is carbon farming. Organic represents a system with grassland, catch crops, green manure, organic manure, and the regenerative principles, they are deeply rooted within the organic farming. I know that there it varies to which degree the principles are really applied yet in practice, but there should be no doubt that the regenerative farming system is really deeply rooted within the organic. And within the organic, we do reach out for agroforestry. So in that respect, organic is an important part of the solution when we shall transform to a climate neutral system. But the way forward is not to establish um, a, a market for carbon certificates. Although the EU Commission and the European Parliament unfortunately have such visions. In the present situation, our food production make up around 30% of the carbon, uh, CO2 equivalent emissions. And this share is foreseen to increase to around 40% in Denmark in 2030. And this is not because the emissions from our food production increases because, as I said, we have this uh, climate law that obliges us to reduce emissions. It is because other sectors, they will reduce their emissions. So the share from the, organic, from, from the farm systems will increase as it looks like now. So it must be obvious that we will not, be, not succeed to become climate neutral if we sell our carbon sequestration to other sectors to help them become neutral. Climate neutrality needs to be reached within each single sector. We have a farm system that is not in balance. The principal reason how we got here is that we have built a society on a market economy that ignore the costs of public goods or that has not put a price on public goods. And that needs to be corrected. In Organic Denmark, we acknowledge the value of the market forces as a strong driver for the welfare reached in the Western society, also within the farm economy and the farm life. But we are obliged to correct the market failure that has created a farm system that is not sustainable. So, Rather than creating a market for carbon certificates, we should benefit from the common agricultural policy. And our proposal for a way forward is to introduce a climate account system together with a system to document space for nature and biodiversity within the farm. It's really important to notice that sustainability requires more interventions at the same time, it requires more than just to deliver on climate. And to become exact, member states, they should fix a CO2 equivalent ceiling and a minimum field ecospace index value that must be met to receive full basic income support. And those figures, they must reflect the national aims that does also reflect the Paris Agreement on climate and the uh, European aims at, at on, on biodiversity. And the CAP regulation, as it is written today, does allow this model to be applied. It says in the where else uh, and in, in the um, articles that the uh, member states, they are allowed to adopt additional GAECs. And they have GAECs on climate as well as on biodiversity. And it does also say within the WRLs and within the articles that the member states, they should adopt a system of sanctions and penalties that, have, or that creates incentives to deliver on climate and biodiversity. So within our model, 
the logic is that if the ceiling, the, the climate ceiling is passed, uh, and the contribution to the field ecospace index is not met, then the basic income support will be reduced. You can call this a tax on climate and lack of uh, contribution to biodiversity. And while do you, if you reach a result below the ceiling or you deliver better field ecospace additional payment from the ecoscheme share is obtained. And I believe we saw yesterday uh, an argumentation that we need to provide more support, more subsidy for organic farming if we should reach the 25% goal. But I do not consider this to be realistic. We will not have an additional budget for the cap. We need to find the money within the cap and applying this system, we, we actually go for a true cost account system. We call our model pricing sustainability. So the higher footprint, the lower payment from the cap. And in that way, it becomes more costly to farm with a high impact on sustainability. That means if you do not deliver on sustainability. And taking this approach, we do also break with the belief that we are able to convince all consumers to buy more expensive product when there's a cheaper alternative. To put it short, we need to make the organic product the best choice for consumers. Otherwise, organic will never be more than a niche product, and we will not be able to deliver a sustainable food system. So the advantages through the model that I described, we provide economical incitement to convert to a more sustainable practice. There's no priority for new technical solutions that rather than system solutions. And there's no discrimination between small and big farms, as is often a result the direct support to buy new technology that normally favors the big farms. And we avoid that support is reflected in the price of the technology solution. The direct support to technology, the, the support will, um, um, will capitalize in the price of, of, the, um, of, of the new technology. And also the challenges to quantify the exact impact at a specific farm or field is solved this way. The accounting system, and there I refer to the carbon sequestration, it can be really difficult to decide whether you actually build up carbon or do you keep the balance in the soil. The accounting system can be arranged that it does include practices that we, for different reasons, are not able to calculate with certainty, like carbon sequestration, either because of lack of research, for example, holistic grazing practice, or because it is subject to dynamics from the soil, the history and the place, and with the weather actually taking on. As, and the reason why we, we, uh, we solve this by introducing by the cap, the cap money is paid as a response of a behavior. We do not claim that it is the exact number of CO2 equivalent that we have calculated, and which would be necessary if you sell a certificate that you introduce in a balance account in another business. This is a more sensible way to spend the cap money. This is public funds for public goods. And it is a possible way forward compared to carbon certificates. That is, in any case, highly problematic as exact carbon sequestration that takes place is not stable. Our proposal is applicable, like I said, with the existing cap. Member states are permitted to adopt additional GAIACs, and it is within the objectives of the cap. We could adopt a climate accounting model within EU to have harmonized model, but maybe it's more ideal that the, each country should apply for an EU approval of the climate accounting system that they want to use. As small countries, they have already developed models, and we should recognize the work that is going on in different countries. It's really important that we support all the initiatives going on. In Organic Denmark, we have developed a model together with the Seges Innovation Center and the Danish universities that we hope will be taken up as a national accounting system within Denmark. And now I just want to show you 
what could be the result if we apply the cap in the way that I here advocate. This is a typical uh, farm landscape in Denmark. You have big fields, no landscape elements, no structures, not really good conditions for life to take place. But changing the cap system and where you introduce the climate accounting together with the field ecospace requirement. You would diversify the use of land. You would reintroduce the animals in the, in the fields. And you would introduce landscape elements. And you can do this while you at the same time have a very efficient farm practice because those structures, you can place them uh, in the length of the fields rather than cutting them uh, across the fields. But to proceed this way, we need that other countries follow the same trail. So I need you, and I hope you got inspired and you are interested in advocating for the same model within your countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sibyl. Also quite an ambitious vision uh, uh, from the organic movement in Denmark, both in terms of emissions reduction from the agriculture sector, but also uh, how to, to transform uh, the cap. And I think it's already very interesting to see the, the different approaches, uh, uh, maybe. Uh, but time flies, so I want to hear from uh, Charles from Sinabio as well, because the French organic movement has been quite active on the topic as well. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. Merci, uh, merci à tous et merci pour thank you, thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you for this, this, this great event and, uh, and for all the, the great contributions we've heard. My name is Charles Pernin. I'm managing director of Cinebio. Cinebio is the French uh, union of uh, organic producers. We've got 215 members uh, processing companies, uh, manufacturers, and, and uh, dis distribution firms. And our role is to support them um, with the you know, elements of, and to help them to make uh, their, towards a model of organic which is uh, demanding and consistent and uh, sustainable. And that's the objective we set for ourselves. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the French context and then give you some, some good news on the, the progress of organic agriculture and climate. And then I will um, go into some more detail about some of the actions that we've launched here in France. And I think hopefully we'll have a bit of time for discussion because I think that is, that's a very interesting things from the other speakers. So let's begin with, um, if I can get the slide. Yes, there it is. On the uh, context here in France, we have uh, an initiative uh, launched by the Ministry for, uh, Minister, Ministry for Ecology called the Label Bas Carbon, that's the low carbon label, aimed to uh, certify as a label awarded to um, farms which are committed to reducing their carbon footprint. I think it's interesting to look in more detail at that initiative um, because to get highlight some of the the, the flaws, or at least the, the obstacles we are encountering, is a kind of these sort of reductive approaches, uh, what, uh, the word Eric used earlier, this reductive approach. Uh, and there are some real challenges here for, for organic agriculture, and the, the challenge being to uh, propose alternative solutions and a, a new vision of the carbon, how to handle our carbon footprint. So this label is a certification awarded to farms, which make a commitment to reduce their carbon footprint. But there are a certain number of flaws and loopholes which have been highlighted by NGOs, in particular the first being that uh, the farms that get the certification don't have to go through the first step, which is the first, the first requirement of public policy before offsetting and compensating. The first action you need to take is to avoid and then reduce emissions. Compensation should be the final straw, the final, the last resort. But this, uh, this label is, is awarded to people who are content to simply offset without thinking about reducing their emissions. It's also based on the, the, the volume of produce, from liters or kilos of produce. So. Uh, um, a, a farm which reduces its, um, its, its 
pr uh, its processes, even if it's it's increasing its output elsewhere, it'll still get the the label. In, in fact, generating more carbon, uh, it'll still get accreditation for the products for which it's sorted. So there's a paradox there, and it seems that it, it fails also to take into account the other factors of the of the climate crisis: the biodiversity, pesticide use. So it's not covered at all by this label. So you might have some farms which are accredited by this label, which which actually do nothing to favour biodiversity or protect an ecosystem. A uh, final point, uh, which I think is important for organic agriculture, it, it fails to look at the, the history of what's been done before. For example, an organic farm, which uh, because of its practices has contributed to carbon storage, carbon capture for years or decades. They're not doesn't get any favorable treatment when it comes to carbon label. It doesn't re correctly recognize the efforts that have been made in the past. And I think it's a good illustration of the, the, the troubles, the, the, the pitfalls that we have in trying to reduce carbon. In fact, the, the, the current policy initiatives on, on the table, what's interesting for, for us is the organic movement, is uh, is what we can do to to more con coherently or pertinently demonstrate our contribution to reducing our uh, climate impact. And I just wanted to share with you two bits of information, two bits of scientific data, which I think will be important. Um, this hopefully will chime with some of the, uh, the the presentations we had yesterday. But I think it's worth sharing them anyway. This is a graph which uh, this is taken from um, an experimental study run by the the National Institute for Agronomical Research in France it compares different uh, farming systems. Uh, this is for large cereal farms, so you've got on the right that organic agriculture, which is the only of those four systems which is a net carbon capture. It allows for net carbon capture in the soil. Regardless of the other the practices, regardless of what, uh, the, including some of the of what are regarded as more virtuous processes, they still generate more carbon, except for, you can see that in the, that little black line there is the median, and organic uh, farming is the only approach which allow, which is, and this is excellent news, which allows us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a bit of good news to, to share with the decision makers as, as widely as possible. Uh, and again, on the question of the advantages of the intrinsic advantages of organic farming when it comes to carbon capture. Agronomic surveys, as you can see at the top there, this is from a scientific journal, shows that the extensive system, the root systems, or ex sorry, extensive farming system, which require little inputs uh, favorable to the development of root biomass, uh, optimizing the nutrition of the, of the plants and also a significant s storage of biomass within the soil. And that's particularly for ex what we call extensive agricultural systems and, and specifically organic. And again, I think that's, that lends weight to the, the faith that we have in our contribution to reducing climate change. Just for a little bit more context for you, what we actually do, what are we doing at Cinebio on this matter? Um, I think we're perhaps a little bit l less advanced than our colleagues in Denmark and Switzerland, but um, we're committed to, we have a number of, um, of uh, initiatives which I think are at least co um, consistent, coherent with what you've talked about in Switzerland and Denmark. The, f uh, the first initiative which we've been working on very hard for the last two years, you heard about this yesterday, I'm not going to go into detail, I know you had a presentation on it already, the Planet Score, this is a tool which allows us to measure environmental impact, which allows organic farming to capitalize on and, and communicate on its, uh, and not just organic farming, but also um, conventional uh, farming systems as well, which have, which have signed up to this. And you can see that the graphic there. We highlight um, the, the climate impact, but also biodiversity, pesticide usage, because um, you can't have one without the other. And we have to promote, to, to take a holistic approach to promoting the, the Agriculture, the 
ecological transition. We also have a, an advertising campaign highlighting the advantages, the positive impacts of organic farming for biodiversity, something we need to talk about more because focusing exclusively on climate and carbon uh, f uh, risks um, distracting us from the, the, the other dimensions, which are overall integral parts of the, of the change. And so the potential imp the positive impacts we have on biodiversity need to be highlighted and championed. More generally, on a more general level, we are doing more and more to promote organic farming as a solution as the most uh, successful and most high potential solution for the tr food transition. I think this is a fundamental priority and has been for some years now, because what we've seen in France, and I don't know if this is the case in your countries elsewhere in Europe, is that we're seeing more and more attacks on, on the, the, the pertinence of organic as a model. So on the issue of uh, food sovereignty, for example, it's been become an issue recently since the war in Ukraine. But more generally, you've seen the the the, the values, the ad, the value added by organic has been has been under attack, particularly on social media. But so we're increasingly active to get out there and and promote and champion the values of bio and on social media through advertising campaigns, and the capacity, particularly of, of organic farming, to progress further. I think it's important to highlight that margin for further progress. So we're on. We have campaigns online, social media. We're working on creating a database of uh, materials, of arguments of, for use by professionals, by organizational, professional organizations and others, promoting a joint unified message on the advantages, the benefits of organic farming. And we're also working hard to promote the role played by uh, the driving force that, that are, are organic companies, are the manufacturers and distributors as a catalyst for change in the food transition. We think it's not just purely an agricultural question. Obviously, we need to change our farming practice, but we also need to get consumers on board. We're talking about changing system with new habits and new attitudes, and for that, we need to win over consumers, as well as producers, manufacturers, and distributors, and they have a big role to play in bringing about that change of behavior. Concretely, we, we provide support for that. We published recently two uh, guides, two handbooks on biodiversity. On the left, you've got the one on uh, in Europe, which uh, covers 20 best practices for better protecting biodiversity in the organic sector. And we recently published the second one on uh, production sectors in the global south, particularly on avoiding deforestation and water uses. So, uh, helping that uh, to support the, that transition with uh, with the business world and in partnership with consumers. We also have a CSR policy, which is called Bio Entreprise Jobs, Sustainable Companies, aimed at companies to help them better get a better handle on their carbon footprint and to control and reduce that carbon footprint. So there you go, just a. Uh, a brief overview of the, the initiatives that we're running at Sinabio uh, on the ecological transition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. And, and please, could we get the, the other microphones uh, uh, working? Because uh, uh, I think it's important that we take a few more minutes to, to hear more from uh, our, our speakers on these important topics. Uh, and. Um, uh, and thank you, Charles, for highlighting the, the, the limits of existing certification scheme, like the French label that you talked about, uh, because it, it is a source of inspiration for the European Commission at the moment. And as you said, there are many ways in which such carbon certification schemes can end up in uh, greenwashing initiatives or, uh, or can end up promoting you know, further intensification uh, uh, of agriculture. So. I have a controversial question for, for all of you. Uh, also, given, given the, um, you know, the, the ambitious vision that you presented from BioSuisse and Organic Denmark as well. I mean, is it really the smart approach for the organic movement to show that it can be very ambitious in terms of uh, uh, contributing to reducing emissions, stocking more carbon? Or should we be more on the side of emphasizing you know, the need for a systemic approach for a transformation of a food system that also include the impacts on biodiversity and pesticide use, a bit like Charles seemed to highlight. 
as well. So uh, I will start with this question to you, uh, uh, Sibyl and Cedric, you know, how does the vision that you presented also take into account, you know, uh, over externalities like the impact on biodiversity as well? Sibyl, maybe first? <coughs> I believe we should not, um, the, the way forward is not to show that organic farming is only a climate solution because when we look into the uh, figures, I mean you, per hectare we have a lower climate footprint but per kilo product it's more or less the same with, as within the, uh, the conventional production and we should promote a sustainable system. So I think this is really the important task for us as a movement to show the world that we need a sustainable transformation, therefore we deliver, we need to deliver on more than climate. And that was also the reason why in the CAP proposal that I presented, I presented the necessity to introduce a carbon ceiling together with the requirement to deliver on, on biodiversity. Thank you very much, Sibyl. Cedric, what do you think of that? Thanks for the question. Um, I think our organic labels can always evolve and be improved. Um, I'm, I'm the first technical specifications, but 40 years ago when Bio Swiss was founded, it was seven pages long, and the main word in it was soil, soil, soil. That's all they really talked about. And we, we know that soil is particularly important in the climate. Uh, I think it's been, it's been well summarized uh, today. Uh, well, and congratulations, by the way, to Denmark for, for Denmark for all that you're doing and for you, Sylvia, in France, too. I think it's all positive things for the, for the future of, of biodiversity. I, I think our labels need to be exemplary. We talked about BioCorp yesterday. They were mentioning that young people are talking about climate so much. I think it's important not to forget that are, the younger generations are very interested in that. We, we need to listen to what young, young people are saying. We need to reach out to them. Uh, it's included in our technical specifications. It's very important to, to be present on that front. Uh, thank you very much. Um, maybe we can take the time for, for a question from you. Okay, I see uh, Andreas, fair. You know the topic of carbon sequestration, but... Can you introduce yourself briefly? It's working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Andreas Gattinger, University of Gießen, Germany. Um, a question or response to Sibyl. Uh, you are very critical on uh, on the issue that uh, sequestration in organic farming is sold to. Uh, non-agricultural activities. Yes, I think uh, you're right, but also within the organic value chain, you have unavoidable emissions like the Congress here. Yeah. Uh, we use cooling devices, we came with train and so on. We are far away from climate neutrality for all these activities. So why not using the, um, an incentive that um, a French organic farmer plants trees, he does more than needed, and using this, uh, this um, initiative for compensating unavoidable emissions. So I think there is, a, there is a risk of double accounting and also for selling off uh, their the own benefits, but I think there's also potential for, for true emission compensation within the organic value chain. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are in the core of a, of a debate and of a controversy as well. So, Sibyl, please. Well, I have not seen a, uh, an account system, a balance that uh, persuades me that there will be a net uh, sequestration. That you know, the, the, the farm system, they are simple, they have sufficient troubles just becoming neutral, that they do not have space for selling it out to other actors. Um, yeah, and, and then I know you know yourself all the other problems with uh, having a, a credible or, or yeah to have a count system that you can believe in and you, it's not unst it's not stable and it it will take years before you actually see the the impact of the carbon sequestration. So I, I and and, and um, all the consultancy work that you need also to demonstrate that you actually sequester carbon. But I believe it's really really nice if companies they will introduce it as part of their 
uh, CSR strategy, uh, common social uh, strategy, that they uh, also uh, do something in order to, to, uh, to make the farmers uh, focus on how they can they improve the carbon sequestration at farm level. Thank you, Sibyl. Charles, what do you think on this? Oui, um, alors moi c'est pas exact. You represent processors as well, so. Oh, oui, oui. Um, mais sans entrer dans les questions. Uh, uh, without getting into too much of the technical issues, because I'm not a, special, a technical specialist, um, I get the impression that what's new in for the organic sector is that uh, maybe 15 years ago. We, were kind of, we had a sort of monopoly over environmental questions about the transition. Uh, I think what's happening now is that these questions as questions for society as a whole, and the organic movement, it doesn't have any natural leadership there anymore. There are other stakeholders, other mo transition models, other, other s narratives, other ideas of what that transition could look like. You know, um, what we could to do with GM crops, what about robotic crops, and data, big data, digital technologies. So I think our collect our, the challenge we face is all, the collective challenge is to, is to, to regain that position of the leadership, our position as, as the leading name, and, our, and, and really inf impose our vision of that transition. I think we've got, the, 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 there's competition out there who, who are, and they've got a lot of resources at their disposal often, these competitors, and I think that's the challenge we face as for the organic movement. I'm, I'm delighted to see that there are concrete pro pro proposals on the table, um, things which perhaps we could share at, um, uh, across the IFOM network, the IFOM network, because so we could have um, common resources and make it more visible and can make our voice heard. The importance of doing better in, in communication about the benefits of, of organic uh, as well. Uh, you want to react quickly, Cédric, on this point of, you know, uh, can we expect the agriculture sector to, to contribute to compensation uh, uh, in other sectors, or is it unrealistic? Alors, oui, c'est réaliste, et je vais donner un exemple de ce No, I think it is realistic. I'll give you an idea, an example from Switzerland, in uh, one of our regions. Every canton in Switzerland has its own climate strategy. And uh, we have uh, some of our we have uh, measures to promote biodiversity within with an organic farmland. The Confederation's uh, goal was to achieve 16 percent. We're now at 19 percent, and that three percent difference. We'd like to use that to have land which is devoted to carbon capture, carbon storage, to be able to use that land for carbon farming, for for biodiversity too, but specifically to, to capture carbon. That's one of the measures where it, uh, well, it's been looked at, study, and that's moving forward very Thank you, Cédric. So we, we'll take uh, uh, ah, maybe two more questions together. Merci. Ah là, ça marche. C'est très différent. Merci. Bonjour, Jacques Kaplan, président of uh, iPhone France, also an agronomist specializing in the some of the subjects we talked about this morning. I want to go back to that question of the connection of not, um, not focusing exclusively on one subject, which I think is extremely important. And, um, carbon farming should be an important part aspect of our promotion. But um, it's important to have uh, points of reference. Yeah, and to, to be able to demonstrate uh, points that we can show to our adversaries and, and our opponents uh, and, uh, and our and our partners. I came across a very interesting article analysis uh, in Nature Sustainability, public, an article published uh, two years ago. A uh, Danish, a Swedish, and a French researcher published this paper. Um, Jovan der Weff was the, the, the main author, the lead author, and they showed how um, carbon capture studies, carbon farm life cycle studies, were totally biased for, for organic study, and they promoted um, ways of, of better taking into account biodiversity, and I think it's really important to have that um, that kind of, uh, of academic academic backing, the, the, the ammunition to, for, to show to our rivals, and to give to very concrete terms about these, um, these terms. It's always interesting to be able to give examples for example, of the, the impacts of biodiversity. We're talking about um, local varieties, of, of lo indigenous varieties. That's a factor of improving biodiversity, domestic biodiversity, and so natural biodiversity too, because the two, the natural and 
natural land and farmland are in constant interaction. It's also an extraordinary tool, a particularly invaluable tool now for adaption to adaptation to climate change. And if we continue to selection, uh, centralize and select essentially our, our selection of, of uh, plant stock, then we'll never be able to adapt to, to drought. So it's about selecting adaptive selection uh, in the fields that will achieve that goal. So those two factors, that's, that's climate and biodiversity, and that's to, in the same examples. I think we need more and more examples like that, more ammunition to, to, to oppose against our, our, our rivals in a reductive view of the... Uh, for this comment. Jeez, yes. <laughs> so I think we, we have to stop uh, uh, this session. So, uh, but let me just say and, and, and thank you very much. Uh, for your contributions, and you also contribute to the reflection and work of IFWAM Organics Europe on this. Uh, recently, we published a position paper with some of your contributions on carbon farming. We published a document highlighting precisely the benefits of organic farming uh, on, on, on climate change. But we also set ourselves an ambitious goal to develop an action plan of the organic movement uh, on climate change in the coming year. So uh, we really need uh, inspiration from you and for, from your initiatives at the national level. So we'll definitely continue these discussions with your contribution. So thank you very much again. And uh, we wish you a very nice lunch and see you back at 2.30. Ah, sorry. My apologies. <laughs>
impacts on the quality and quantity of water that we have. It's going to degrade the quality because the water, will, the water is heating up much quicker and evaporating much quicker as well in the rivers and so on. So we're obviously losing efficiency. So and by 2050, we'll be going through periods of the summer periods, and we're likely to lose about 50 percent of our flow, especially with the garon here. And uh, the water will heat up quicker here too. Probably we're going to concentrate the pollution we have there as well. So these are climate change effects, and the mainly, uh, and this is where we have to work on a program to p preserve the quality of water, but also face up to climate change challenges and adapt and have a program for mitigation, for attenuation of these effects. And then the second point is probably in the framework of our mission, we are faced with pollution. So our mission practically is to handle pollution from industrial uh, sources, uh, from domestic sources and so on. We were created 50 years ago to answer to those objectives. And uh, there are still issues at stake. There's one in particular relating to micro pollutants and pesticides. And there are two phenomena. One, artificialization of soils and the French government has announced 500 million euros to regenerate nature in the cities, and this is a major issue for the cities to protect against uh, these heat spells. And uh, also we need to struggle against, to fight back against pesticides. In, in, in the Garonne we've got 30% uh, of our water table which is polluted above standards affected by chemical agricultural pollution. We have 40% of our rivers that are now uh, uh, qualitatively in a kind of a deficit situation, a negative situation. So we've had to adapt. Uh, we know that we're going to be, have a capacity to have a good condition by 2027 in compliance with the objectives. Uh, we haven't managed to reorientate uh, French agriculture to fulfill that objective. So. We could say that we're not the only people to uh, face this problem in Europe, but that's no reason for us to renounce. So we need to accelerate things. That's what we're trying to do on the territory, because for uh, organic farming, we've concentrate, concentrated on areas where we're in greater difficulty, especially to preserve the quality of drinking water. But despite that, in the uh, Adob Garonne, we're talking about uh, two million people who are drinking water, which is not compliant with the regulations, especially in terms of herbicides, nitrates. So it's important to be able to accelerate, accelerate transition to have water that answers to this quality. And this means that we have to have organic farming. And in the Adorgaran territory, we've multiplied these surfaces by three in, in just uh, in a period of uh, less than 10 years. So that's important. We managed to achieve rates that are fairly significant. And uh, I'd mentioned the Gers department with 38 percent with the with averaged out organic farming. So obviously there's less pesticides there. And if you look at uh, the what, what, there was, what it was like before uh, on these territories, obviously we have a duty based on the use of phytosanitary products. Well, obviously th th it's not coming down. So there's a problem. We need to have more organic farming, but the efforts made by others are not to be compensated by a loss of fresh water. If we continue in to increase conventional farming and calling on pr chemical products and ignore the efforts of organic farmers, we're not going to be improving the quality of water. That's where we stand at the moment. So in other words, the level of pesticides and herbicides in, in particular and nitrates in the water is increasing still on our territory because there's greater organic farming, but uh, that's why we've committed within a pact that we're going to validate shortly to ensure that we know that uh, organic farming is necessary. So in this sector, we clearly need to have 30 to 35 percent of organic farming where there are impacts near to the rivers, the watercourses, the places where we actually capture the water for human consumption and so on. And we also need conventional agriculture to be less dependent on chem the chemical industry, to be better adapted to have more living soils with humid zones. I, uh, 
I'm not in favor of 100% organic, but we need to have a, a model, an overall model. So, not doing, not facing up to the issue would be uh, endangering the agricultural activity on the territory. So this, these objectives are shared by everyone. So the reform needs to be ambitious, but this was the subject of the debates over the last couple of days. But uh, HVE must be in the PSN, and uh, Alain Rousset, who's the president of the uh, region, this is something he's supporting for HVE to be differentiated in the future cap. I don't know if he'll win out on this, but uh, certainly this is going to, this was part of your de debates yesterday, so that's important. The Basin Committee was there to, to support this. And the second point is, this is what you mentioned earlier on, uh, to do with echo scores, where the, or the planet score, all of these topics help us have a global approach. So we need evaluation criteria on water, on biodiversity, on carbon capture, and we need a global approach. We've looked at a number of applications in France here, but uh, they've been much too sex sector based. Uh, we're preserving a particular plant, a particular animal, and so on, but we don't have a global system. We've started to uh, set up a system for payment for services, and we've helped uh, 900 farms with this global approach and recognition of the functionality of agriculture and its economic role, because we're looking for economic profitability in favor of the environment. So this adequacy between productivity, economic profitability, and what we can add the, to the environment in the terms of resources. And that's what we need to look for as a tool, uh, to have a more, more global approach. And that's what we're doing, working with the regions, working with the various agencies to have that balance on our territory. And uh, at the moment, we're in a kind of an emergency situation, and we need to be thinking of what's going to be done over the next 10 years. 10 years' time, what we're doing now won't be feasible anymore. Thank you. I take your presence here today as a form of recognition of what we are doing here in the territory. And I'd like to thank all the uh, players, the stakeholders, in, uh, uh, and uh, they've not always been listened to sufficiently in the past. So, so thank you. We need you, your essential players here as elsewhere in Europe. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Choisy, et uh, au nom d'Interbio Nouvelle Aquitaine et Diform Organics Europe, je tiens à vous remercier à nouveau d'être partenaire de ce Congrès européen de l'agriculture bio mais aussi pour, pour le, le soutien de votre agence de l'eau, de, de beaucoup d'agences de l'eau en France, euh, au développement de l'agriculture biologique. Et, et je dois dire que, travaillant à Bruxelles, c'est souvent un exemple qu'on qu met en avant auprès des institutions européennes, cette, cette contribution des agences de l'eau euh, et cet intérêt des agences de l'eau pour le développement de l'agriculture biologique, euh, pour la qualité de l'eau aussi. Donc, euh, merci encore. And